I'm going to introduce all of the presenters for this group at one time, and then we'll switch out presentations as we go. Hopefully, that, I think that'll save us a little time. Uh, so this next group, uh, Dr. K. Calpadrier is a retired university professor with degrees from McGill and McMaster in numerous academic publications on wide ranging topics. After her fulfilling academic career, Kay retired to South Georgia, where she and her husband have a bamboo farm. She is the president of the Southeast chapter of the American Bamboo Society. Her presentation is Remnant Landscapes, Georgia Cane Breaks Then and Now, Georgia's Cane, cane Breaks Then and Now. Followed by Dr. Walter Campbell, who is an independent scholar and documentary filmmaker, hailing from Savannah, uh, Savannah, Georgia, he holds a PhD from UNC Chapel Hill and has published works with Duke University Press. He received the E. Merton Coulter Award from the uh, Georgia Historical Society and an Emmy for his PBS film, The Editor and the Dragon. His presentation is America's Bamboo Farm. Finally, Dr. Mike Hodgkiss with degrees from Georgia Southern, Clemson, and UGA is a retired plant pathologist with, US, with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Uh, for most of his career, he studied the management of pecan and, if I said that wrong, I'm sorry, I know we have different views of that word, uh, pecan and peach diseases in the southeast. He also worked with the USDA bamboo germplasm collection, maintaining plots and overseeing distribution of bamboo plants. His presentation is Where Enthusiasm Meets Reality, the USDA's Effort to Build a, bam a Bamboo Industry. my neighbors and we were talking about a lot of things and I happen to mention a river cane restoration project that's going on at the Oak Mulgee National Monument and I was explaining the man I was talking with his name's Davis mid-20s extremely bright very observant graduate of Georgia Tech somebody who knows the land born in Wayne County hunks fishes knows the land as well as anyone, or I would argue better than most. Anyway, I was telling Davis, there's three kinds of native bamboo. I was talking about the gigantic, Arundinaria gigantea, then there's tecta, switch cane, and then there's the hill cane, the new species, uh, Appalachiana. And Davis suddenly said, hang on now. You mean there's bamboo native to this region? And I said, yeah, we see it all around here. You know, just, just look around. And he said, where? And I said, oh, by the landing, you know, where you put your boat in. <laughs> I said, you see it, you see a lot of it there. And what was interesting is not so much that Davis had never seen it, but rather he had never noticed it. And this is what ethnobotanists call a example of species blindness. One's oblivious to the presence of something. And so by not seeing it, you render it invisible. If, however, we go back 150 years, the question would be, how could you not notice it? Here's an example, 1827, and it's a description of Cambridge. It talks about what it's used for. It grows so thick as to be almost a compact mass. The smallest sparrow would find it difficult to fly among it. And to see its 10,000 stems rising apparently contiguous to each other is to look at an impervious uh, roof of verdure which it forms on its top. It has the aspect of being a continuous solid la layer of greenness. A man could not make three miles a day to a solid and unbroken cane brick. It is the chosen lair of bear and panther. Another uh, description, the Ultimaha River, uh, talking about the cane break, a cane break, not cane breaks, but a single cane break. In 1870, a young man's magazine 
and it talks about the swamp region going towards the coast, a cane break extending 30 to 40 miles, maybe three to four miles wide. The swamp is covered with this cane break. The canes are 25 to 30 feet high, so tight you can scarcely enter. In place, the cane break gives way to islands. You see oak, flatwoods, maybe bay, cypress, and so on. South was covered in cane breaks. Oops. I'm sorry. It was so important to the Native nations of the Southeast, to the Cherokee people, the Creek, Creek Muscogee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and others, as to be considered a keystone cultural species. That is a species that shifts at the intersection between cultural and ecological systems. A species for indigenous people, uh, for the indigenous peoples of the Southeast, it ties them to location and place. It's central to a way of life and identity a sense of being and belonging. And River Cane definitely had that place to people from the Cherokee Nation and all manner of other Native nations. It was used for every aspect of life, for shelter, roofs, maps, buildings, utensils, tools, blowguns, fishwares, arrow tips, foodstuffs, the sea, that it produced was eaten, basketry, music. One man in Cherokee Nation I know, Roger Kane, he says, take a look at the glyph of Coco Pelly. He's in the Southwest, but what kind of flute is he playing? That's a cane flute. They obtained that in trade. Graphs, trellises, and so on. As one native elder put it, everything we need is here. So much so that one could argue the buffalo, we could make this comparison, the buffalo was to the Lakota what River Cane was to the Native nations of the Southeast. So the question is, what happened? A 1995 study by Reed Moss et al. on endangered ecosystems says only 2% of cane breaks are still around. In other words, 98% gone. Based on my surveying, and this is anecdotal observational, I think the amount that they quote 2% is actually high. I think it's much less. So what happened to the cane breaks? It's very tempting to say that early white settlers didn't care that they had no use for cane, that it was something native and not something that the settler communities were interested in. However, that's not the case. I have an, a quote from a, 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 actually a piece from a newspaper article, and thanks to Georgia Archives for having this material so easily available and so searchable. It is marvelous. But here's 1767. This is approximately 30 years before the first shipment of cotton went out of Georgia. And it's shipping from Savannah, Customs House cleared. And you'll see there's rice, there's lumber, there's singles, there's deer skin, and 3,000 cane reeds. In thinking about cane reeds and the ecosystem, it's very important to consider the difference. Oops, oops I did there. It's very important to consider the difference between the plant and what it offered and the habitat. So cane reeds as a commodity versus the cane break as an ecosystem. The number that I just showed you from 1767, the shipment of 3,000 cane reeds, that is not a one-off. The exports continued from the 18th century 
all the way through the beginning of the 20th century. And there was a period during the Civil War where the ports were blockaded, but there were exports. The numbers are extraordinarily high. 5,000 bundles of cane leaves, 3,000 bundles, 6,000 bundles, 12,600 bundles, 16,500 bundles, 10,000 bundles, 7,500 bundles. A shipment going to Glasgow, uh, and, and, I'm sorry, these went to various ports. The Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Glasgow, Liverpool. A shipment bound for Glasgow, includes 2,160 bales of cotton, 150 bales of sea island cotton, 13,000 feet of feet plant, feet plank, that's lumber, 5,000 bundles of cane reeds, and one cask of rice. Another example, this is from uh, 1865. There was a fire in a warehouse in Savannah a lot of things were destroyed, among which was a shed containing 1,000 bundles of cane reeds. So that begs the question, what the heck were they doing with cane reeds? 100,000 bundles, that's a heck of a lot of fishing rods. The answer to that question is, uh, surprisingly interesting that the cane reeds were used in creating a part of a loom that's known as a cane reed or known as a reed. And we have on the top, it's a, a page reproduced from a 1709 survey of plants from South Carolina, low country South Carolina, and it describes river cane. And it talks about angling rods, fishing rods, and what weavers use. These are examples of cane reeds, and they kept the thread from the weft of a loom in place. And I have a little show and tell up here. I actually have a damaged one, and this is part of the, these are called dents made from Georgia River Cane. So if after the presentations, if you want to come up and take a look at the cane reed used in a home loom, made, uh, the reeds were shipped north, manufactured all around the Boston area, New York, all kinds of makers, marks of the manufacturers and used for home weaving. Just to give you a better visual this is the reed. And these are some advertisements that, again, are from newspapers. Reed cane available, notice to weavers and others, and then a little discussion about during the Civil War, the port was blockaded, but now it's been lifted and we can start resuming shipments of cane reeds. And just a very quick glimpse of how they were made. They were split, so the cane was split, and then the reed was made, woven together, and used, as I said, in the home looms. Uh, cane reeds were also used in other ways. Women's fashion. This bonnet, bonnet is called a kalesh, like a chair, uh, carriage cover, and all of these stays are cane reeds. breaks as the ecosystem is a whole different question. And they were considered to be the most forbidding places, dark wilderness. Again, you read lots of literature, you survey a lot. I've been reading the newspaper articles from the 18, from 1760s all the way up through the 20th century. And it is a repetition of a pattern. Highwaymen, horse thieves, murderers, fugitives from the law, attack, I put in quotes, attacking Indians, runaways, bootleggers, illicit st uh, stills, army deserters, and wild beasts. Wild beast. It's a literary trope. 
being lost in a cane break, being able to, to get out. Uh, cane breaks were places of exile. There's an interesting newspaper article, 1848, which talks about a steamboat heading up one of the rivers. And there's an Englishman who is frequenting women's quarters, so much so that the captain says, we've got to put them out. And so where do they stop? Of course, at a cane break. <laughs> they stop and they put him out because it is a place of immorality. As an ecosystem, cane breaks represented not land to be tamed, but rather land to be eliminated. A lot of figures of speech, colloquial expressions, cane break, a person uncomfortable in Santiago society, they would rather camp in a cane break. A useless task, it has no more purpose than preaching in a cane break. And then preaching would be in a cane break. This one I find a little haunting. 1917, and it's an era where there were a lot of lynchings, and a colloquial expression for murder, i.e., lynching, show someone a cane break. The cane breaks get, get eliminated. And it was because, not so much because they were thought of as useless and forbidding places, that, that was you know, places to be eliminated, but there were two positive features of cane breaks that show up in the 19th century, mentions newspaper articles and discussions of cane breaks. One, that is very good land to be cleared and planted, fertile land. Second, it is good for cattle grazing. The, and this is from an 1893 article about why you should let your cattle go graze in a cane break because the leaves stay green in the winter, so it provides nutritious winter pasturage and foliage. The dense growth provides shelter for cattle during the cold winter rains. And because a lot of the cane breaks are on wetland, swampland, the matted roots provide for a good footing. And in all of this is the implicit contrast. Harvesting from the land is something people want to move away from to putting the land to proper use. There's a very interesting quote, 1849, which describes this imagine, imaginary vision. Look out over a cane break and instead see a land of bread and meat. Or you plant the corn there and you'll always have bacon. So land to be eliminated. What happened to the cane breaks? In effect, they were eaten by cattle or by the corn that settlers planted and consumed. This is the other question. But what about the value of the export commodity of cane reeds? Uh, the commodity, it had value. They were selling a lot. And the answer to that question is very simple. Follow the money. Fashions changed. Steel and brass replaced the cane beads used in the looms. The Industrial Revolution continued to progress, replacing home looms. New technologies came on board, left cane breaks literally in the dust. So what we see now in Georgia, the Carolinas, Louisiana, other regions that once had vast acreages covered with cane breaks, what we see now are remnant landscapes. Back, I was driving from Reedsville, which is the Tetano uh, County, and I was headed back home. I lived down in Wayne County, and I was getting ready to cross the river. And as I was driving along, I'm at the floodplain of the river, about two miles away from the bridge, the river. The land had been planted in slash pine, and it had been clear cut, so the pine had been harvested. 
and driving along, just gazing out at land that was harvested when something caught my eye. A tree line had been left right at the edge of the planting. And I said, hang on now, hang on. I stopped and stood for a while, just gazing over the land. Because what I was seeing at the tree line was River King. And I stopped and gazed for a while because what I was looking at was a fossil landscape. Remnant landscape here and there. Now I want to close with just a couple of comments. Uh, among the communities of people from the Native Nations of the Southeast, there's a major River King restoration movement going on. Even as we are sitting here right now, the gathering of people from the Cherokee Nation and other nations, members of what is known as the River Cane, River Cane Alliance. And these are people who are very concerned with planting, recovering, and recreating some of the restoring. I, I don't want to say recreating, but restoring some of the cane breaks. This basket that I brought in is uh, made by Shona Kane. Uh, she lives in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. She made it about a week ago, and it's from river cane that was harvested just a short while ago. And it's very much part of the River Cane Alliance is to not just restore the landscapes, but also recall and remember the type of traditions that River Cane involved. You can see it from a distance. The pattern is known as fish scale. And then I have a, another couple of examples after the talks. You can come and take a look at in 1850s. This is the mean cane used on a loom. This is a settler basket, a basket made by settlers, settler community. That's it. So this is Mr. H.M. Stanley. There is a fine grove there, he said, which shows that bamboo can be easily grown in the southern section of the state, especially in the coast counties. Shortly thereafter, in his annual report as commissioner, Stanley briefly summarized the bamboo and its uses. His summary reflected nearly 40 years of government and private promotion of bamboo's potential use in the South. It is a giant grass that reaches its perfection of growth in tropical and subtropical regions. It reaches a height of 70 to 100 feet with a trunk from a foot to three feet in diameter. It is a close kin to the South's native cane breaks. In England and the US, some species are used for landscape gardening. Split bamboo is used for nets, hats, umbrellas, and fishing rod. The Chinese use it for making paper, roofs, ceilings, and sides of houses. After, and the shoots of some species are eaten like asparagus or are pickled in vinegar and are even used for making beer. Stanley's promotion provided another strong incentive for the Smith family, the owners of the grove, to put their farm in its one acre bamboo grove on the market. To be sure, nobody lived on the place, and visitors from the United States Department of Agriculture had recently shown an intense interest in the family's bamboo grove. The U.S. government purchased the property in 1920, and the USDA used it for almost six day, decades as a foreign plant introduction garden. The facility imported hundreds of plant species from possible cultivation in the U.S. Excuse me here. Oh, well, the facility imported hundreds of plant species for possible cultivation in the U.S., but became widely known as the bamboo farm for its focus on testing and cultivating bamboos from around the world. The USDA closed the facility in the late 1970s, however, and then deeded the property to the University of Georgia in 1984. The facility is administered today by the University's College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. It receives funding from both the state and the Friends of the Coastal Gardens, a 501 C3. And it is operated as the Coastal Georgia Botanical Gardens at the historic Bamboo Farm. 
The facility is located 12.5 miles northwest of Savannah at the intersection of two of the oldest roads of any consequence in the state, the Ogeechee or Darien Road, which is now Highway 17, and uh, the Fort Argyle Road, which is now Canebrake Road. The grove reportedly originated in 1890 when Marietta Smith Miller planted several bamboo sprigs behind the house and adjacent store owned by her parents, John and Eugenia Smith. According to Marietta, she got the bamboo from Valambrosa, a large rice plantation located three miles away on the Aguichi River. The plantation had been owned by Laura Moinello since 1872 and had been managed by her second husband, former Cuban revolutionary Andres Moinello. Although the couple occasionally wintered with their family at Valambrosa, they lived in Savannah and Andres commuted by railroad to the plantation. Why he planted the bamboo there, where he got it, and when are not clear. He died in 1912, three years before USDA agents found a struggling patch of Phyllostachys bamboo soides growing at Valambrosa. Bamboo soides is the same species of timber bamboo USDA agents found flourishing simultaneously in the grove started by Marietta Smith on her parents' farm three miles away. The species is native to China, but has been grown extensively in Japan since the 1860s. Although Moinello's widow told the agents her husband got the bamboo from India, they knew that was unlikely, and they were unable, in fact, to verify anything the family told them about Moinello's bamboo. My research suggests, however, a couple of answers to where Moinello's bamboo came from, when he planted it, and why. The bamboo almost certainly came from Japan in the late 1870s or early 1880s, and Moinello hooked to sell it to either or both Thomas Edison for use in his incandescent light bulbs, or to a company that made fishing rods and bamboo furniture in Western New York. Early in 1879, the Commissioner of U.S. Agriculture, William Gates LeDuc of Minnesota, brought several species of Japanese bamboo to Savannah. He also brought a message that government officials and private entrepreneurs would repeat, refine, and expand over the next half century in promoting bamboo as a tool for economic development in the U.S. South. According to the Savannah Recorder, LeDuc showed us several specimens of the bamboo. He is trying to introduce us as an article of commerce. It can be grown here with great success and as a commodity would prove a great revenue for our state. LeDuc also reportedly gave personal supervision and direction to the planting of some of these bamboo plants. Moinello was a prominent Georgia plant and would have been well aware of LeDuc's visit but no evidence has surfaced that the two men ever met. Whatever plants and information LeDuc did bring to Savannah, he almost certainly received months earlier from Sen Suda, a prominent agriculturalist in Tokyo, Japan. The two men had exchanged letters on trees, grains, and plants in Japan that might prove valuable in the United States. Their exchange reflects a crucial point about bamboo's introduction into the United States. It was part of a larger global process of plants, trees, seeds, animals, and people in motion. Suda described bamboo as the most useful thing that grows for our agricultural purposes. He then mailed LeDuc 14 packages of bamboo with some brief planting instructions and a list of Japan's most important bamboos. Suda listed madake as the most useful species of bamboo in Japan. Madake is the Japanese name for Cyophilostachys bambusoides, the timber bamboo the USDA would find flourishing at the Smith Farm in 1915, but almost eaten away by hogs at the old Moinello plantation. Not only was madake prepared and eaten the same as asparagus, Suda wrote, but it was also used for many other purposes covering food, making hats and shoes, printing, chairs, fences, hedges, etc. If Moinello missed LeDuc's local promotion in Savannah, he might have obtained a rhizome or a cutting from the bamboo left by the commissioner, and he may have been inspired to do that, in fact, 
after Bamboo's debut in the national spotlight the following year. In the summer of 1880, while Moynello and his family were in New York, the New York Star announced that Thomas Edison had adopted Bamboo as the filament for his incandescent light bulb. A similar story appeared later that year in the Savannah Morning News as Edison's agents discovered near Kyoto, Japan, a large grove of the perfect bamboo for his light bulbs. It was Madake, and the owner was growing it to sell bamboo furniture makers in Tokyo. Edison would continue to use Madake bamboo to produce millions of his light bulbs for more than a decade. In the meantime, in Shanghai, U.S. Consul General Owen Denny showed both an official and a personal interest in promoting Chinese bamboo. He had 20 boxes of bamboo transplanted from China to his home in Oregon. And in 1881, he published a consular report on bamboo, how it is utilized in China. The Chinese use it for at least 500 different purposes, Denny wrote. He noted its frequent use in place of iron and steel, and then reinforced the government's promotional focus on farmers in the U.S. South. I've been induced to make these remarks in the hope that our government might favorably consider the advisability of introducing this plant into the southern states and such other localities as are suitable to its growth. The problems inherent in these early bamboo promotions were many, of course, and for the next several decades and for many different reasons, Japanese bamboo received much more attention in the United States than bamboo from China. Particularly important was the accelerating export of Japanese seeds, trees, bulbs, and ornamentals to North America and Europe. Two closely, closely cooperating companies, both owned by German-born Americans, formed a major Japanese-U.S. plant nexus, L. Bamer & Company of Yokohama, Japan, and H. H. Berger & Company of San Francisco, California. Thanks mainly to Helene Berger, widow of the California company's founder, Bamboo's promotional message expanded beyond the plant's common everyday utility to include, even privilege, its beauty in the landscape. A group of bamboos is one of the most graceful sights in nature, Berger's 1886 catalog explained. The company was then offering 30 varieties of bamboo among its wider business of supplying by far the greater portion of the Japanese plants sold in San Francisco, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, San Diego, also in Florida, Louisiana, Georgia, and the entire South. While selling bamboo was important to Berger, it was just one of the many plants she was importing from Japan to sell in California and in the U.S. South. Berger published catalogs and illustrations. She gave lectures, wrote articles, and provided Japanese engravings for magazine photographs all emphasizing the beauty of Japanese plants, gardens, and bamboo. To be sure, most if not all of the earliest recorded bamboo groves in the U.S. South were started in the 1880s and 1890s by local nurserymen and horticulturalists who ordered bamboo from Berger as part of their larger, more extensive orders for the company's bulbs, seeds, trees, and plants from Japan, many of which, if not most, could have been categorized in the United States at that point as non-native or recently introduced, but certainly not invasive, a term first coined in the 1950s. It's possible, of course, that Moynella bought bamboo directly from Berger, but again, there is no documentary evidence of a contract, uh, contact between the two. So who or what inspired Moynella to plant bamboo at Valambrosa? Perhaps the best explanation is the one mentioned earlier, that Moynella planted bamboo with the hope of selling it to Edison for light bulbs and or to the fish rod and furniture company in Syracuse, New York. Circumstantial evidence suggests that major inspiration was the fishing rod business that became the Syracuse Bamboo Furniture Company. 
Among the local Syracuse capitalists backing the furniture company were several local investors also backing the Engelberg Huller, an invention for hulling coffee and rice. Moinello examined the Huller in 1889 while on a visit to Syracuse and then scheduled a promotional test for it on his rice crop at Vallambrosa after returning to Georgia. Was he already growing bamboo at Vallambrosa by then? Or did he arrange to do so after visiting Syracuse in 1889? We don't know. But as mentioned earlier, Marietta Smith Miller claimed she got the bamboo in 1890 from Vallambrosa, the Moinello rice plantation. Although the Huller proved successful for its Syracuse investors, the Bamboo Furniture Company went bankrupt early in the Depression of 1893. Edison decreased, then stopped using bamboo in his light bulbs. Moinello's wife mortgaged, then lost Vallambrosa to a bank in 1896, and Berger entered the seed business in New York after the collapse of her Japanese plant network in California and the South. The Yokohama Nursery Company became the new nexus for growing, gathering, and distributing Japanese plants in the 1890s. In addition to its operations in Yokohama, it had offices in San Francisco, New York, and London. The company was led by Uhei Suzuki, one of the Japanese middlemen who had helped German-American Louis Bamer start his successful business in Yokohama in the early 1880s. Suzuki was so successful expanding the business, one source estimates that more Japanese gardens were built in the U.S. in the early 20th century than in Japan. The USDA also centralized bamboo matters in 1898 with the creation of its section of seed and plant introduction under David Fairchild and his small group of plant pathologists. The mission of the SPI, as it was known, was to gather information on the culture and care of potential plant products from around the world and then aid in the creation of a market for those products. While Fairchild continued to promote bamboo's potential for economic development in the U.S. South, he and his colleagues also promoted what they considered systematic research on all the plants they investigated. Fairchild quickly set sail as the SPI's agricultural explorer, making plant collecting trips around the world, funded by his wealthy friend, Barbara Lathrop. It is Lathrop, as we shall see, who purchased the Smith Farm and Bamboo Grove outside of Savannah. It was during their trip to Japan in 1902 that Lathrop and Fairchild launched an aggressive new phase of bamboo promotion. Lathrop distilled their pitch into a simple, familiar argument. Bamboo is beautiful as well as useful, he stressed to Fairchild. We should have them at home. It may take a long time before Americans can learn how to use it, but they'll never learn if we do not introduce the plant. Fairchild worked closely with Uhei Suzuki and the Oklahoma Nursery Company to select 2,000 bamboos, which Lathrop paid to have shipped to San Francisco in the summer of 1902. One year later, the USDA published Fairchild's Bulletin, Japanese Bamboo and Their Introduction into America. While he acknowledged bamboo's beauty and usefulness to small farmers, Fairchild wanted large landowners, co-operators, he called them, who would grow big groves of bamboo. As he told one reporter, we hope that commercial groves of bamboo timber can be grown throughout the South and they will be as profitable there as they are in Japan. Manufacturing phonograph needles, paper, and paper pulp were high on Fairchild's list, but these efforts eventually failed as steel needles reproduce, uh, replaced bamboo and southern forests provided pine trees for newspaper pulp. Fairchild's largest cooperator, Tabasco heir Edward McElhaney, aggressively promoted the papermaking campaign and also hoped to can and sell bamboo shoots at Avery Island, Louisiana, a goal he never realized. Fairchild worked closely with Suzuki and Yokohama Nursery Company to import huge shipments of bamboo to the U.S. from China and Japan, but planning errors led to failure and frustration. In Chico, California, for example, the few bamboos that survived in the government test garden there were transferred to Brooksville, Florida, to a USDA field station designated specifically for the introduction and testing of bamboos from around the world. 
By the spring of 1915, however, the future of the Brooksville station appeared bleak. Most of its bamboos failed to thrive as problems with fungus, insects, soils, weather, and personnel mounted. That's when Smith Birdsey Dayton showed up in Fairchild's Washington office carrying items he had made using bamboo from the Smith Grove outside of Savannah. No one then lived on the farm in Dayton, an unhoused street person who had known the Smith family for years, believed the family was about to sell their farm. Dayton knew the bamboo had recently been harvested from Vallabrosa, the old Moinello place, and he was certain that the Smith's Grove and Farm would be next. Fairchild immediately sent SPI agents to Savannah. The agents described the Smith Grove as a magnificent plantation of this beautiful plant. The plant was Madake bamboo, the timber species the Fairchild considered most valuable. As for Valenbrosa, the Moinella plantation where Marietta Smith had gotten the bamboo, the agents were disappointed. Hogs had eaten all but a few struggling Madake plants. The SPI's visit to the Smith Grove occurred four months before Georgia's Commissioner of Act, Commerce and Labor, H.M. Stanley, announced the grove's potential as a gold mine. It took another two years, however, and America's entry into World War I before the Smith heirs reconciled their differences over selling the farm. And only then did Fairchild and Barbara Lathrop inspect the property together. Still another year passed, moreover, before Fairchild in November 1918 arranged for the president of the Central of Georgia Railway, Alexander Lawton, to buy the farm for Lathrop. Lathrop then leased the property to the government for 99 years at the rate of $1 a year before Congress in 1920 allowed the Secretary of Agriculture to acquire the property for $1. Fairchild had the Savannah Garden named for his old friend in 1927 following Lathrop's death. And for the next 50 years, the Barbara Lathrop Plant Introduction Garden specialized in the importation and cultivation of bamboo from around the world. Yet the garden also introduced hundreds of other plant immigrants for possible cultivation and use in the U.S. It is a federal plant introduction garden, Fairchild stressed in 1928, not a demonstration farm nor a local experiment station. Its object is the preliminary trying out of new foreign plants to see if they can be grown here and their distribution throughout the states believed to be suited for their cultivation. As for bamboo, Fairchild later acknowledged privately that our crass ignorance with regard to how to use the bamboo has held us back very much in our campaign for the planting of these plants themselves. We've always been a bit vague as to how the bamboos were going to be utilized, and our vagueness has been felt by the prospective planter. Even so, Fairchild remained convinced of the educational campaign, which is sure to come once the groves are large enough to furnish abundant material. Although a few large grove groves were cultivated between the late 1930s and the 1960s, the attendant educational campaigns flourished only briefly before the USDA closed America's bamboo farm. Fortunately, bamboo research continues today with promising new industrial, environmental, and ornamental uses. Indeed, with ornamental horticulture, the fastest growing sector of American agriculture, it seems unfeasible, unfeasible economically, socially, and political to label as invasive all 1,500 species of a naturalized plant like bamboo. Thank you. As a well, as mentioned, David Fairchild uh, was promoting uh, bamboo and his USDA bulletin, Japanese Bamboos and Their Introduction into America, was published in 1903 at the onset of this effort to uh, encourage bulk, uh, bamboo cultivation and use. The Plant uh, Introduction Office imported bamboo and sent it to various cooperators. Eventually, the introductions were sent to Brooksville and uh, after they determined it was too wet down there, they sent them on to uh, uh, Savannah. But 
Barbara Lathrop gave the farm to Savannah in 1919, and the first farm manager was Mr. Edward Rankin. Uh, this is showing the grove uh, before the farm was established. And then this is uh, the first structures that were built was the uh, Mr. Rankin's house and a barn, and you see the grove in the background. Uh, they used uh, techniques developed in Japan to produce uh, bamboo uh, plants and rhizomes. They dug small plants in a plot and let it grow for two years. Then they, uh, after they obtained good growth, they dug up the plants and the rhizomes. The rhizomes were cut up into uniform sections, 18 to 24 inches. Uh, the cut ends were dipped in wax to, uh, so they wouldn't dry out and placed in boxes filled with sawdust, and then they would fill orders as they came in. Uh, they were uh, shipped out by rail and later probably by uh, truck freight and, uh, and by mail. Uh, but uh, it allowed them to uh, disperse a large number of uh, bamboo propagules to the public as opposed to digging up individual plants that were a lot more cumbersome to uh, to dig and to uh, transport. Uh, the, let's see, bamboo was promoted in USDA publications, extension service bulletins, newspaper articles, and in local extension offices. The Savannah Station developed a series of information sheets on bamboo cultivation uh, and species available and their uses, and they can, uh, dispersed those at the station and also sent them to a lot of extension offices. Uh, so this was how interest in bamboo and knowledge that there was bamboo available from the farm was uh, gotten out to the public. Um, Interest in bamboo occurred before the farm was created, and other bamboo, such as uh, moso and fish pole bamboo, had already been introduced. Uh, David Bissett became the station superintendent in 1924, and uh, that's when the uh, bamboo was moved from Brooksville to Savannah. Uh, the bamboo uh, effort was uh, really prospered under uh, Bissett's administration. He continued distributing the bamboo plants, uh, but he also uh, distributed poles to uh, landowners and researchers and businessmen who wanted to develop products uh, with it. One of those cooperators was the Hurdy Foundation in Savannah. And let's see, catch up. Well, there's another uh, picture of the, yeah, this is the rhizome production here. So. Uh, they would cut these rhizomes up into pieces, and this was the nursery that they had established before they, uh, they dug it up. And they had a series of these nurseries over the years. They would move them around so that they could uh, kill the bamboo in one spot because they changed the species that they were producing. Uh, this is a picture of uh, David Bissett in the bamboo grove. And, um, this was a, a shade house constructed of bamboo grown on the farm. And here's a picture of the staff of the uh, Hurdy Foundation, which had promoted and developed the uh, uh, industry of producing newsprint and paper from Georgia Pines, and they wanted to do the same thing for bamboo. Um, plants from the station, uh, let's see. Yeah, they provided the material for uh, them to test several species and determine that you could produce several different types of uh, paper, including newsprint. And um, uh, we used to have some samples of that paper and pulp, and it looked just like any other paper and uh, pulp, even though it was made from the bamboo. Um, plants from the station were later provided to paper companies that were putting out test plots. And um, they, uh, they did plant them out in the field and they were hoping to uh, you know, expand the acreage, but this program didn't last very long. And uh, the uh, Frank Linton, uh, who uh, worked at the uh, 
farm after the university of got it. Uh, said that there were several reasons that this project ended. One, no nursery outside of China or Japan could supply 50,000 rhizomes to begin the project. They were not able to acquire 250,000 acres of land on which to plant. Three, a special pulping mill would have to be built uh, to use the bamboo. And the estimate of a 25 year return on investment was unsatisfactory to investors. So a project that had taken up a lot of time and effort was uh, canceled. Um, other projects were smaller, but easier to complete. In a letter to a supervisor in 1944, Bissett reported several things that they had done with bamboo. They had uh, donated poles to the local army air base for floating sea targets. Uh, plants were requested by state game uh, commission to provide protection or cover for animals and forage for deer. Uh, orphanage requested poles to remove Spanish moss from pecan or pecan trees. And um, the uh, Soil Conservation Service wanted bamboo plants for windbreaks uh, for vegetable uh, fields to uh, prevent the wind from damaging the uh, uh, crop and also to keep uh, sand from uh, dam damaging it. Um, this it died in 57 and W.O. Hawley became superintendent with Herbert DeRigo as his assistant. Research continued on bamboo at the station and also at uh, Clemson and Auburn universities. Research was done at the station to determine uh, the optimum fertilizer applications for growing out bamboo for uh, these uh, pulp projects. Um, also, they looked at different cutting cycles. So they would plant a large area of bamboo, they'd cut a strip, and then the next year they'd cut another strip and they wanted to know whether you could cut it every year or every two years or three years or four years. And a three to five year cycle was considered about the optimum. Um, and that's cutting all the canes uh, regardless of age in the plot. For pulp, you can do that. If you are harvesting for construction, you wouldn't be able to do that. Another important figure in the USDA uh, uh, program of promoting bamboo was Floyd McClure. He was in China and uh, as Warren mentioned, a lot of the early information and plants came from Japan, but later China became more important as a source of new species. And uh, McClure was a professor at a, a college in Canton, and he was also interested in the economic aspect of uh, bamboo and other crops. And so uh, he uh, partnered with the USDA and over a 20 year period up to 1940, he uh, discovered a lot of new species of Philostachys in China and uh, other genera of bamboos and he shipped those to the USDA. And uh, so a lot of the bamboo that were used in some of the research in later years at Savannah came from these introductions. Um, after McClure left China, he, uh, he still worked for the USDA and later for the Smithsonian, mostly in Central and South America. But uh, he would stop by, well, he'd correspond with the people at Savannah and stop by to look at the plots. And he actually named a, a a cultivar of one of the species uh, on one of these visits that we now know as Robert Young uh, bamboo. It's a, a type of uh, viridus and it's a very attractive and popular bamboo now. Um, the bamboo research effort ended in Savannah in 1965. Um, some people have said that the war effort in Vietnam was taking so many uh, resources that uh, the budget for agriculture was less. I don't know if that's true, but um, it's been mentioned. Um, it was supposed to close in uh, 1980 and it did uh, close in 1980. 
Prior to the closing, many individuals, nurseries, and botanical gardens came to Savannah to dig uh, bamboo plants. Um, Kanapaha Botanical Gardens in Gainesville came and got a large selection, as did uh, uh, a botanical garden uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, Mercer Botanical Garden. And the collections are still educating visitors uh, today. So uh, even though they were closing, they disperse their material to other places that could continue the education. And of course, the University of Georgia maintained the plots at Savannah and did that as well. Um, then the question became, what were they going to do with the collection? So uh, they finally uh, decided that there wasn't room at the other plant introduction station in Georgia for the uh, bamboo. And uh, they got a horticulturist at the USDA lab in Byron, where I worked uh, for many years on fruits and nuts. Uh, he agreed to uh, oversee uh, the collection and be the curator. And uh, Charles Adamson, who was the last scientist at Savannah, uh, he and uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Horton, the horticulturist, uh, moved the collection to Savannah. I mean, uh, from Savannah to uh, Byron. And uh, is still there today, uh, Dr. Melanie Harrison, who's at the uh, Plant Genetic Resources uh, uh, Lab uh, at Griffin. Uh, she's the curator of the collection. Uh, so, uh, it continues to provide plants primarily to researchers. Uh, we've uh, provided material for a project such as wastewater treatment, biomass production, nutrient composition, and uh, used as a forage plant. One of our more interesting things was uh, we trained Zoo Atlanta staff on how to identify different species of Philostachys so that they could go out and identify the species in groves that were being donated for the pandas. Turns out pandas are picky eaters and they prefer some species over others. Or when they're offered a choice, they do. Um, so what was the result of the past century of effort to establish bamboo as a, a useful plant? Uh, the vision of David Fairchild and others did not really come to pass as they had hoped. Uh, a substantial number of bamboo plantings were made in Georgia and throughout the Southeast. Unfortunately, a lot of the objects they hoped would be made from it did not appear everywhere. Uh, the bamboo came to the U.S., but the skilled craftsmen did not follow. Uh, one exception was something that was fairly easy to make, bamboo fishing poles. Several locations met the demand in the Southeast for bamboo fishing poles with locally produced poles. And let's see here. Yeah, that's some of the material they were testing for the paper. All right, this is uh, a publication that uh, Fairchild wrote to promote the Barbara Lathrop uh, Plant Introduction Garden showing the grove in Savannah. And, uh, this was one of the promotional items uh, in 1937 that mentioned Savannah and uh, talked about bamboo and probably got people interested in ordering. All right, so this is Mr. William Crandall, and he had this business in Douglasville, Georgia, not too far from Atlanta. Uh, and he uh, had 40 acres of bamboo, both leased and uh, some that he owned that he harvested uh, bamboo from. He sold thousands of uh, bamboo fish poles and he sold larger diameter poles uh, for uh, decorating and, and use around the house and all. And it was a pretty substantial business. I don't know how long uh, he was in business, but um, uh, we had a letter in our files where he had sold a few poles to uh, the station down at Savannah. I don't know what they were using them for, if they were just trying to support his business. But, uh, and uh, let's see. And this is a picture of Floyd uh, McClure uh, in China. 
and uh, showing him out in the field. And let's see. Um, <clears throat> One thing that happened in the 70s as they were closing the station down was that a lot of the uh, bamboo, including the big timber grove, flowered. And when bamboo flowers, it dies. Or at least uh, it it can die or it, it uh, the large canes die and it comes back uh, kind of shrubby like this for a few years. Now it did recover from this flowering, but other species grown at Savannah didn't. And um, so uh, this was an event, that same strain of bamboo, uh, if it was growing in Japan, would have flowered at about the same time. That's the interesting thing about bamboo. And yeah, that's all the slides, so we'll leave that up. Um, but uh, so uh, in more recent times, uh, we're still interested in industrial uses of bamboo, but we don't have enough material. I spoke with one uh, company uh, rep. They were making uh, this uh, decking with uh, plastic and sawdust, and they wanted ground bamboo. I said, well, I could do that. I could probably borrow a, a hammer mill and give you a sample. How big a sample do you need? He said, 25 pounds. Well, that's a lot of ground bamboo. I said, if you ordered some, how much would you need at a time? He said, 25,000 pounds. There isn't enough bamboo in the state of Georgia probably to sustain that for very long if we ground everything we could find. And so that's one of the problems uh, Resource Fiber, a company in Alabama, wanted to produce bamboo rail ties, uh, but the investment uh, needed kept increasing and they couldn't secure enough financing and they had to declare bankruptcy, unfortunately. Uh, and that was just recently, uh, within the last couple of years. Labor costs and the lack of large tracts of bamboo will limit the size of some of the local uh, smaller businesses that we do have. Um, and uh, then we uh, can talk about the uh, <clears throat> flip side of bamboo. How many of you uh, know of bamboo groves near where you live or work? Yeah, that's a lot of hands going up. Well, that's a result of all this distribution and so some people don't like these groves around and uh, they want to get rid of them, especially in natural areas. So um, uh, the plant is on a lot of invasive plant li lists as a moderately invasive plant, even though it does not really produce seed to any appreciable amount. And so the spread is all done by humans primarily uh, maybe a little bit of rhizomes washing down a stream, but mostly by humans. And so, but it never dies out or rarely. So uh, it persists in the uh, natural environment. Uh, interestingly, one uh, large grove of bambusoides is at the Chattahoochee National Recreation Area in Atlanta. And it's a popular destination at the recreation area. I don't think they're going to remove it anytime soon. And uh, one wildlife refuge in South Carolina called us one time. They wanted to get rid of a grove. And uh, we weren't able to help them out. It was too big for us to try to harvest poles out of and to deal with all the fallen canes and all. But. Uh, uh, the reason they were getting rid of it wasn't because they were bothered by the bamboo. They'd be happy to leave it. It was because um, people were coming in and harvesting the bamboo shoots without getting the proper permit. 